I guess I don't need a microphone, but I'll try it anyway. Keep it under control. I am your 9 o'clock speaker, um, Kyle Murray from the Oklahoma Geological Survey at the University of Oklahoma. On the agenda, it says I'm going to present about Osage water, but that's not true. I'm going to talk about something else. <laughs> um, sometimes we're asked to submit topics and abstracts and information long in advance, so I didn't have a title at the time they went to press, and here, here we are today. So I'm going to first introduce myself and describe what it is that I do, and then try to present a study that I'm in the process of publishing right now through the OGS Geology Notes newsletter on the stack play in Oklahoma. But hopefully you'll see how some of the things that I've done there are applicable to Osage, and I'll talk about Osage and the state of Oklahoma in general to some degree. So this is the title of the, the paper that will be published, and hopefully you'll find it interesting. So yesterday, you may have seen a talk by our associate director, David Brown, who um, talked about what OGS is and what we do. And he mentioned my name, but I want to talk about what I do since my bio is not completely complete in the program. And then uh, you'll understand why I'm kind of going through the, the presentation the way I am today. So I came to OGS at the University of Oklahoma in 2011. I started working on November 1st, and I'm the first hydrogeologist employed by the Geological Survey and was founded in 1908, so over 100 years of OGS research and investigations without a geologist on staff. We are charged with investigating water resources. But I moved to Oklahoma on November 1st, and if you may, you may remember, the earthquake occurred in early November of 2011, so I moved into my house and the earth started shaking and my shampoo was swinging. So uh, not too long after that, the, the buzz around OGS and the research community in the state of Oklahoma was, what's going on with these earthquakes? We need to understand this. And a lot of people started asking questions about hydraulic fracturing, saltwater disposal, and were they related to seismicity? So being the, the only water person in our college, it became sort of my personal mission to, to study that topic and learn more about it. Be able to answer questions about hydraulic fracturing fluids and saltwater disposal and these types of things. So I've been spending most of my time on that line of research surrounding water and the energy industry since I came to Oklahoma. So eight years now. And I recently was invited to be a guest editor for a special issue of Resources Journal. The title of the special issue is Water Management in the Energy Industry, and that's exactly what I've been telling people that I've been doing for the last eight years. So it's exciting to have that opportunity, and hopefully I'll, I'll educate you about water management in the energy industry in Oklahoma, and how it might tie to seismicity and other things. So what is it that I do specifically? Well, I spend a heck of a lot of time in my office by myself building databases of various things. This is a, a list of some of the things, freshwater supply, I'm a hydrogeologist who studies groundwater and freshwater in the state of Oklahoma. But then we're also interested in brackish water so that we can alleviate the use of fresh water when possible. For example, hydraulic fracturing doesn't need to use fresh water. You could use brackish water as that makeup fluid. And then hydraulic fracturing volumes, as I said, uh, I also look at water to oil and water to gas ratios because we don't have a reporting system for produced water volumes in Oklahoma, so you have to find a way to estimate produced water volumes, which means if I know how much oil is produced and I know the ratio of water to oil, I could potentially estimate produced water volumes. And the same for gas, if I tabulate the gas production and I have a water to gas ratio, I could estimate the produced water volumes associated with gas wells. And then, of course, the saltwater disposal volumes. When I 
moved here in 2011, nobody knew how much water was disposed or where it was going. And in 2012, I started to dig into that, and I've been working on it probably daily since then, trying to gather that information from the OCC and EPA in some cases. Along with that data is the enhanced oil recovery volumes, and then I've been monitoring subsurface pressures. I'll show you a little bit of that today. I've been tabulating produced water quality data and fresh water and brackish water quality data, trying to understand rock and reservoir properties, and then seismicity. So I have databases for all of these things on my laptop right back there, and could tell you a lot of things that you might want to know about Oklahoma, specifically the fluids that were managing in Oklahoma. And I, it's not necessarily artificial intelligence that I'm using, but I'm trying to analyze and synthesize all of that data and the thousands and thousands of hours I've spent putting it together to now make sense out of it and answer questions. So that's a, that's a long introduction to the topic, the topic being what's going on in the stack is what I'm covering today. So the stack is located doesn't work on that screen. The stack is located obviously in west central Oklahoma. Canadian, Kingfisher, and Blaine County are kind of the center, center points. I usually cover five counties when I do data analysis. You can see from this map view the oil and gas wells that started producing from 2009 to 2015. I gathered this data from IHS and then put it into my databases and plotted it. But what I've started to do uh, probably in about 2013, I started to do this. I took the producing formations, which there are more than 450 in the state of Oklahoma, and I tried to group them or organize them into a meaningful, um, smaller number of zones. So what you see on the left side are the 10 zones that I used to, to categorize producing uh, formations and then disposal zones as well. So we have the Permian is the youngest all the way down to the basement which is the oldest. So the, the points on the map have a color code that corresponds to the zone from which they're producing oil or gas. So you see a lot of those dark blue wells in north central Oklahoma. You see the rust colored wells in the stack and the scoop and down in the Arcoma Basin in the southeast. That's the Woodford dark blue is Mississippian. And then in Osage, you see um, some of those cream colored, which is Des Moines age, so the Red Fork, the Burbank, the Bartlesville, Skinner, those all fit into the Des Moines age producing zone. You see also see Mississippian in Osage County, but the primary producers, I think in Osage, are Des Moines age rocks, Mississippian age rocks. And then our disposal zone, which I'll talk about the most today is the, the Arbuckle, that light blue color. We don't really produce a lot of oil and gas from the Arbuckle. There are about 250 wells in the state that produce from the Arbuckle. But that's our primary disposal zone. So as I said, when we started having earthquakes, people began to ask questions about the potential relationship between saltwater disposal and seismicity. So I began to put together data on saltwater disposal. This shows you that we have a lot of saltwater disposal wells in Oklahoma. There's about 3,500 that are active at any point in time. Back in 2009, it, it might have been on the lower end of 3,000. In 2015, it was probably closer to 3,500. Today, it might be a little bit lower than 3,500. And that's not counting the Osage wells, which are a little bit harder for me to get information for because they're managed by the EPA. And the data's not readily accessible. But what I've done is compiled data from the annual fluid injection reports and now more recently the daily fluid injection reports for the area where we have seismicity. You can see the symbology there shows you higher rate wells are bigger symbols and they're color coded so the purple are the highest rate wells for that four year time frame 2014 to 2017. A lot of high rate wells in north and central Oklahoma and very few high-rate wells in the Osage County area, as you can see. So seismic monitoring, 
if you look at the spatial relationship between seismicity and saltwater disposal wells, you can see there's pretty good spatial correlation, so to speak, it's, at least in general. The earthquakes primarily occur in central Oklahoma and north central Oklahoma. That's where we had some of those high rate wells. The chart at the bottom, this is the typical chart that I'll show you today multiple times. It's 2009 to the end of 2018. That's monthly data. This one shows earthquakes, earthquake rate. So magnitude three or higher earthquakes per day is how they're represented. So you can see I moved here in November of 2011 <coughs> when we had the Prague earthquake. And until 2015 and 2016, that was the highest rate of earthquakes or highest seismicity rate for the state in our history. We obviously had our peak seismicity in 2014, 2015, declining 2016, 17, 18, and I have a total by year on this chart here. So in 2019, it's not on the chart, but we are probably going to end up with fewer than 100 magnitude 3 earthquakes. So getting closer to, I don't know, 2012, 2011 rates. So when the earthquakes began to occur in 2011 and then picked up in 2013 and 14, a lot of attention was given to them and the Corporation Commission specifically needed to take some action. So what were they doing at that time? They were trying to figure out, okay, what's the potential relationship between saltwater disposal and seismicity? We think that's most likely to be the culprit here. So you look at the earthquake rate on the top that I showed before, the key events are highlighted on the earthquake chart, but now I'm showing on the bottom saltwater disposal. These are from 2008 to 2018 because I started to compile this data. You can see saltwater disposal here, and these color codes correspond to the zone into which we're putting the saltwater. So, if you look at the, the size of those wedges over time, there's really not much of a change in these upper Pennsylvania age rocks where we're putting some salt water, pretty constant rate there. But that light blue color, that's the Arbuckle zone. You see a pretty dramatic increase in salt water disposal rates from 1 million barrels per day back in 2009 or 1.2 up to a maximum of more than 3 million barrels per day. So an increase by almost three times the disposal rate. Today, we're down closer to 1.5 or so million barrels per day into the Arbuckle. That's statewide, but most of that occurs in central and north central Oklahoma because of the geology. So the Corporation Commission and the research community and the general public can probably look at this if you have the information available and say, well, there's probably a correlation between saltwater exposing the Arbuckle and seismicity. They are trending kind of the same way. Interestingly though, there's a time lag. You see a peak disposal in the end of 2014, and you see a peak seismicity in 2015. So maybe that makes sense from a physical, operational, me mechanistic standpoint, because if you put water in the ground, it's not gonna potentially make it to the fault or affect the stress on the fault immediately. It might take some time. So the research community from near and far jumped on, especially the seismological community. Oh, there's seismicity in Oklahoma. Let's go study it, and let's publish as many papers as we can and wave our arms a little bit and, and uh, try to get our name out there. So that's what happened. But the con general consensus in the community was saltwater disposal into the Arbuckle is related to seismicity. So the Corporation Commission began to act. One of the things they did was, okay, if there are any wells that are completed in the basement where the earthquakes occur, we want those to be plugged back away from the basement. So a lot of operators tried to prove either that their wells were not in the basement or they said, okay, we'll plug them back and we'll document that. So these are the number of plug backs, over 200, close to 250 in that time frame. So that began to occur in 2015. And then the Corporation Commission started to have directives, in other words, voluntary 
reductions in injection rates or disposal rates into the arbuckle. Sometimes they, the directive said, we want you to shut in a well, which means no disposal. Most, most operators comply immediately, so I like to call them voluntary. But every time we had a magnitude four earthquake in 2015, 2016, there was a response from the Corporation Commission, and they were trying to limit disposal right around that magnitude four earthquake. Eventually, it became overwhelming. It looks like a pattern of spaghetti. So they encompassed the whole area of interest, central and north central Oklahoma, with that outer boundary. The goal being to reduce disposal volume by 40% and return to 2012 levels which I think has been accomplished if you looked at my chart on the previous slide. So Osage happens to be on the northeastern edge of the area of interest, and there were some directives that affected Osage operators. So OCC worked with EPA to, to make, um, take some actions there. And you can kind of see these, these um, overlapping areas of interest. On the opposite side of the area of interest is the stack, where I'm going to talk about the data that I've put together in the synthesis I'm trying to do now to understand fluid production, fluid injection, and potential relationships to seismicity in, this, in the stack, which happens to be just outside of the area of interest. There's not a lot of arbuckle disposal here, but it's within this dashed line, which is now an area where the Corporation Commission has operators follow a protocol for hydraulic fracturing related seismic events. So if, if the magnitude 2.5 is observed and it seems to be associated with this hydraulic fracturing operation, then you want to do this. If there's a magnitude 3, then you need to do this, and so on. So there's some interaction between OCC and the operators, and of course OGS, because we maintain the seismic network. So the stack is kind of on the edge of of the area of interest for solar disposal into the Arbuckle, and then right in the middle of the protocol, hydraulic fracturing protocol area. I don't know what the outlier, outlier area, I don't know what they call it, focus area. So I, I kid a little bit that the general consensus, people were waving the arms, that their arms that solar disposal in the Arbuckle is related to seismic. I kind of kid a little bit because we didn't really have the data to answer that question decisively. And we still don't necessarily, because we can build any model, but we don't necessarily have the true information from the subsurface. For example, stress on a fault. Nobody can measure stress on the fault, and nobody can connect that to a strain that occurs in the subsurface related to saltwater disposal. So the things that are going on here, if you try to think of it in two simple terms, when, when we produce fluids from the ground or we inject fluid in, in, to the ground, we're creating some kind of stress. Okay, we're stressing the subsurface. We're relieving pressure or in creating pressure. So earthquakes and fluid management are stress and strain relationships. So if we increase the stress, and that stress propagates to a, a fault or affects a rock body, and it makes that rock body strain, then we, we have um, manipulated the system. Stress and strain relationships. So when our, the strength of our rock is exceeded by the stress, we might have a failure as an earthquake. So the, the stress increases until we exceed the strength of the rock, and we have a break or a strain. So back before we started to take actions and really have our blinders on and look at only saltwater disposal, there was a study of in potentially induced seismic events throughout the U.S., and there were multiple activities that were related to oil and gas activity and potential seismic events. So we have oil and gas extraction, secondary recovery, wastewater injection, reservoir induced, so a surface water impoundment is filled up or drained rapidly, geothermal activities, and hydraulic fracturing. So all of those are stresses. You add 
fluid into the subsurface or you add a mass of fluid on the surface and that creates stress. And potentially the seismic events are the resulting failure or strain. So it might be nice to be able to look at all of those activities in a quantitative way and try to figure out which one actually has the greatest correlation to seismic events. So I've, as I told you at the very beginning, I spend all my time building databases of various things. A lot of those are fluids going in, fluids coming out, and those are the stresses that I think are potentially related to seismic events. So this is kind of the step by step how I might build some of these databases and how I have been building them. So when we drill, we use water and hydraulic fracturing operations and we inject fluids into the subsurface. So I can obtain that data from IHS. I can also obtain it from Frac Focus, although IHS is probably a better source at this point. It's more complete. So that's what I do, I put it into a database. I can obtain production, fluid production of oil, gas, and if in a real in a good scenario, that have produced water as well. Not in Oklahoma. But I can I can look at the water to oil, water to gas ratios that I mentioned earlier. I can get all of that information from my chest. So I can at least quantify oil and gas production and estimate produced water volumes doing some voodoo mathematics. Then the injection, underground injection control program, those reports go to OCC. I've been compiling that data for years. So I have that information. And then OGS has an earthquake catalog for seismic activity. So I have injection for hydraulic fracturing on the, on the front end of oil and gas exploration and development. And then we produce the fluids. So there's a different stress. And then we put fluids back into the ground. That's a different stress. That's kind of on the tail end of the oil and gas exploration and development. And what I can do with this information is do some simple statistics, and I'll show you examples. Pearson correlation coefficients, simple mathematics that you do with a spreadsheet, and then S statistics to figure out which ones are significant, statistically significant. So this is um, statistics 101 for correlation analysis. So we have an independent variable of an unknown type. Here it's called X, and we have a dependent variable. You can see that label. So we say it's a dependent variable. And we can fit a straight line through them, hopefully. We can force it to be a straight line. And we can compute an equation. Of course, M is the slope of the line. And B is the y-intercept. So the y-intercept here is 75, roughly. The slope is 1.1. If it was sloping in this direction, it would be negative. And then you can compute the R squared value, which means um, how closely you can predict Y if you know X. And that's computed using the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, and then you square it, so you get the R squared value. Pearson's correlation coefficient ranges from negative to one to one, so we have either a direct relationship or an inverse relationship, sort of like the slope of the line. If we square it, it ranges from 0 to 1. So there's no correlation at the 0. It's random, totally random. And it's perfectly correlated if it's 1, R squared value. So in this particular example, I don't know what the R squared value is. It's a synthetic data set. But it's pretty good, right? It's probably 0 0.9, 0 0.85, some, somewhere in that range pretty strong relationship. So if you knew what X was, you could probably predict Y pretty closely. Okay, so let's put this back into the context of oil and gas production and saltwater disposal and hydraulic fracturing injection and earthquakes. So our independent variables, no, dependent variables, first of all, is the earthquakes. Can we predict how many earthquakes we're going to have using 
any of the independent variables. So our dependent variable is earthquakes. I have 10 years of earthquake data now. And I've broken it down by month, so I have a fairly high resolution of data for earthquakes, 120 data points. The independent variables are, I'm going to work through all of these, hydraulic fracture and injection by different fluid types, oil production by zone. Remember, I had 10 zones and two miscellaneous categories, so I have 12 different producing zones times 120 months. I've got hundreds and hundreds of data points to put onto these graphs. Gas production, salt water disposal, and soil recovery. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all of these independent variables, put them here, and put earthquakes here for the stack. Stack production, stack earthquakes. And you'll see what those correlation coefficients are. And then we can decide, is there anything meaningful here? So let's go to the stack. I said earlier that there are five counties that I use to characterize the stack. I'd love to use a little boundary, but no one's really drawn a boundary around the stack. So the county boundaries work pretty well, at least in the database. So I've got Canadian, Kingfisher, Blaine, Custer, and Dewey are my five counties in the stack. I have the scoop on here. That's my next paper. Grady, Stevens, Garvin, Carter, and Marshall. And what I plan to do in the future is move to geologic provinces and actually clip the data for those provinces. Anyway, here's the seismic data for magnitude 2.3 or higher earthquakes per day in the stack. That's our magnitude of completeness, so I've dropped it down a little bit. We have a better seismic network today than we did back in 2009. You can see the seismic activity in the stack has been increasing in 2017, 18, maybe 19, relative to the earlier years. That's a little different than the state Y pattern that we saw. The increase was back here, 2013, 14, 15. So I think an explanation for this is there's a whole lot more going on in the stack today than there was back in this time frame. Hydraulic fracturing, software disposal, production, there's a lot more stress in that system created by these activities. But let's, let's keep this trend in mind. So we have very little activity here, and seismic activity 16, 17, 18, and even into 19. I think most of my charts stop here at the end of 18. So the first one, we inject fluid into the ground, create a stress, that's hydraulic fracturing. And don't tell me it's not creating stress because it's designed to do that, right? It's designed to break rock, so that's a stress. And guess what? When you break the rock, that's the, that's the strain or the micro-seismic event that you might observe. Here's the seismic, I'm sorry, the hydraulic fracturing fluid injection on the y-axis here. And it's categorized by type. So this blue is just water. Orange is slick water. Gray is gel. This other blue is FLUD. I have to investigate what that is exactly. And then green is X crosslink gel. So you can see, maybe, in general, we've got more gel and more slick water in the more recent years. <coughs> so what I've done is I've done an R squared value for each of those six different fluids. Plotted the fluid here with earthquakes here. And this is the one that's the highest. This is gel frac fluid per month. The R, the R squared value is 0 0.4608. Does it, look, does it look like there's a linear trend? Yeah, maybe. Not super strong. You're not going to have a lot of confidence if you if you estimate a frac fluid rate per month. You may not be able to predict how, predict how many earthquakes we have. So we can look at oil production in the stack, monthly oil production. Again, these color codes are by zone and not very much production back in 2009, 10, 11, 12. Started to pick up at 13, 14. And the Woodford, that rust color, we produce some oil from the Woodford in the stack, but the Mississippian is the dark blue color. So we're producing oil from the Mississippian in the stack. That's the Merrimack, Mississippi Lime, Mississippi Solid. And 
various other Mississippi native rocks. And it turns out that you see that increase in Mississippian production, it has the highest correlation to seismicity, 0.4646. Not super high, again, but there is probably a better trend here, at least visually you can see that, Mississippi inverse earthquakes. Gas looks like this. This is in barrels of oil equivalent, 100,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day. There was some gas production back in 2009. Woodford kind of kicked in early. And maybe Mississippian picked up in more recent years. Highest correlation coefficient, Mississippian gas. Second highest is other gas. That's this light brown color at the top. Other, I'm sorry, the blue color in between. Imperceptible here. So those are very low relatively speaking, correlation coefficient. So if we produce gas, there's not very strong correlation to seismicity. Saltwater disposal, remember my saltwater disposal diagram from early on talking about the entire state of Oklahoma. There was a big wedge for the Arbuckle group, that light blue color. Well, there is a little bit of Arbuckle disposal here, probably mostly in Kingfisher County because it makes it does touch the Anadarko shelf rather than the Anadarko basin. So there's a little bit of our buckle disposal. But most of the disposal in the stack is in Permian, this red color, Virgilian, green color, Devonian to Middle Ordovician, which would include the Wilcox and um, McLish and other things like of that age. And then the multiple and undifferentiated, that means it's commingled injection between more than one of these zones. So you see an increase in disposal volumes and if we do correlation coefficients by zone, the Permian disposal has the highest correlation coefficient in the stack. The volume of middle order emission, this yellow color has the second highest correlation coefficient. So this red wedge and this yellow wedge, we compare it to the seismic seismicity rate chart they would have the strongest correlation. Again, you can see the visual there. Maybe there's a trend, maybe not. What about enhanced oil recovery injection in the stack? Well, that's been pretty constant over time. And it looks like I have a data bust here. In 2016, there was some Mississippian wells doing EOR, surprisingly. Um, maybe that one didn't get reported that year. The rate correct or something. If we do a correlation coefficient for those, Arbuckle, EOR, in the stack has the strongest correlation, which kind of makes sense if you look at this figure. The only thing that really changes over time is, oh, suddenly we have Arbuckle enhanced oil recovery showing up here when the seismic activity is also sort of getting elevated. So that's what the Arbuckle EOR looks like. Okay, so that's, a, that's kind of a lot of quick and dirty statistics for you. Let me, let me summarize those things and try to make some sense out of it. So, the, there are numerous factors that are correlated with seismicity. We can compute an R-square value for anything that has that same resolution of, of data on it monthly time scale. That's basically what I'm doing here. Taking monthly data of fluid management, and monthly data of seismicity rate, limiting the regional extent to the stack. So we could do that for a lot of different things. We could do reservoirs, we could do uh, groundwater production, we could do rainfall, put those on a monthly scale and do the correlations. And I've done some of those things in other places but uh, the data that I have for the oil and gas industry is, is more complete, so I can do a better job of it. But nonetheless, if you do the correlation coefficients, the highest value that I have for the stack is 0.467. That's salt water disposal into the permit. Now, that's, that's not necessarily telling us that there's 
there is a correlation. We have to understand if that's significant statistically. So we do another round of analysis called an S statistic, which takes the number of samples, calculates the degree of freedoms, just degrees of freedom. So if I have 120 months of data, that's 119 degrees of freedom, plug it into the equation, and it tells you uh, what threshold value is above which your data is significant at a certain confidence level. So I did that for all of the data. It's pretty easy to do. And I used a 99% confidence interval. And so the correlation coefficients for most of these are, are similar, right? The oil production, gas production, the highest one is similar kind of across the board in the 0 0.45, 0 0.46 range. But if I apply the S statistic, I think that the two that kind of stand out as the most significant, not necessarily the statistically um, purely related, the most significant are Mississippi and oil production and gel frac injection. Now, the difficulty I have with, with this is they're all related to each other, too. So if you hydraulically fracture wells that are going to be completed in the Mississippian, well then, ultimately, you're going to produce fluid from the Mississippian, oil and gas, and water. And then you're going to take that water and you put it back into the subsurface. So they're all kind of cross-correlated to one another. So the correlation coefficient of 0.46 doesn't necessarily mean anything uh, without considering what's happening around, around it. And so the things that I'm still wrestling with, how strong should the correlation be to be significant? Um, the first plot I showed you with the synthetic data set, there was a nice straight line. I would say that was 0 0.8, 0 0.9, somewhere in that range. It looks pretty, pretty reasonable, and it might be significant. But I don't know if, if these numbers really approach a uh, significant level. Correlation definitely does not mean causation, because I, I could run these numbers for something that's not related to stressing the subsurface, and I might get a strong correlation monthly time scale data, I might even get a correlation that's higher than 0.46. So that doesn't necessarily mean causation. And this kind of reiterating the same thing here, a lot of things can be correlated to seismicity. The value of the correlation depends on what the quality of the data are and the meaningful physical explanation that's behind it. So there could be a correlation without any meaning at all. And the cross correlation here. So I guess ultimately, we need to do more to really understand what's happening. And I kidded about papers at the beginning that were published in 2013, 14, and 15. They were making conclusions without having the data to support those conclusions. So they were trying to build a model to model stress or pressure in the subsurface. And they don't have any way to measure what that predicted value, how well that predicted value matches the reality. So that brings me to, I have a couple more slides to kind of demonstrate what we're trying to do to get closer to validating models. So this shows the area of interest for seismicity in Oklahoma with the seven geological provinces that the OGS and OCC kind of agreed on at one of the coordinating council meetings. They're consistent with geological provinces that we've been using in Oklahoma for a long time. The Anadarko Shelf is here. This is the northern part of the Anadarko Basin. Of course, it extends down to the southwest. Then we have the Cherokee Platform. We split it into central, southern, and southeast. They're separated by faults that we think are substantial enough that there's vertical offset and potentially fluid isolation. So if you inject fluid here, it probably doesn't affect what's happening in the subsurface here, for example. So the Nemahal Fault, there's a lot of throw, 400 feet, 1,200 feet in some places. It's not likely that arbuckle water disposed here is going to cause a pressure change over here. And then we have um, Kay County is the North Cherokee platform, and we have the Nemahal uplift. And Osage County is kind of off in the 
outside the area of interest <coughs> as it's currently defined, but still part of the Cherokee platform. So it's quite possible that what's happening here in the subsurface and here is relevant to what's happening in Osage County. So one thing that I've done is I've uh, I've gotten a proposal funded to instrument saltwater disposal wells that are completed in the Arbuckle and no longer being used for disposal into the Arbuckle. Mm. This was funded by the Oklahoma Independent Petroleum Association back in 2015. We put instruments in place in August of 2016 and they're still in place. We've been collecting pressure data from these wells every 30 seconds for more than three years. So what we have is a barometric pressure gauge in three of the wells to kind of um, remove the barometric effect from our data. We have pressure transducers below the fluid level in 14 wells today. At one time we had 15. One of them had to be taken out. But we have four in Alfalfa County, two in Grant County, we have three in Payne County, one in Lincoln, um, one in Logan, two in Noble, one in Garfield. At one time we had one in Pawnee, but that one's no longer there. So we had potentially close to the Craig earthquake, potentially close to the Cushing earthquake. Noble uh, were put in place after the Pawnee earthquake, and we had those in Alfalfa and Grant County where there was some activity, in, um, particularly in 2013, 14, 15. So this is not necessarily a correlation, but it's kind of the same idea. We're measuring fluid elevation on the top. That's what we're measuring. This is, so that would be a, an example of what the strain would be. How does this, this system respond to all of the stresses that are going on. Production, injection, atmospheric, um, tidal, solar, whatever the stresses are, that's the strain that we see in the fluid level. So in this particular well, the fluid level when we instrumented was 880 feet elevation, and today it's about 820 feet, so it's declined 60 feet over three years. This middle one represents the stress that we, uh, we being the Corporation Commission, are concerned about as it relates to seismicity. That's injection into the R buckle in barrels per day. We're looking at two to, to the fifth, so we've got five zeros on there. That would be 200,000 barrels per day is the peak rate. This black line is the sum of all of these other lines below. So these are wells that were within 10 kilometers of our monitoring point. You can see there's been a decline or decrease in the injection rate over time from 200,000 barrels per day down to about 100,000 barrels per day. So it's decreased uh, by about 50%. <coughs> And so at this resolution, you can't necessarily see a stress and a strain relationship perfectly, but you can in some cases see, um, in general, a decline in, in stress and a decline in the fluid elevation means that there's, there's a resulting strain. This bottom chart shows you the seismic activity within 10 kilometers of our monitoring well and also the frac notices. So the earthquakes are these little black symbols, magnitude two to six on the side, and the hydraulic fracturing uh, frac notices are the red lines that appear on specific days and times. So you can see, um, in general, there's maybe a decrease in seismicity with some activity in this 2017 range. This is South Alpha 1, so obviously close to the Kansas border. That's my northernmost well. But what we're trying to do with the data is use the observed pressures 
as a target for building models. So we, I had a master's student, Marlena McConville, build a, a groundwater flow model for this region, which includes six of our pressure monitoring points. And what we have done with it is taken the injection data, taken the geologic data, built a geologic model, um, run a simulation where we have the actual injection rates, and now we have observations of the pressure in subsurface that we can compare the model results to. And we can use those pressure monitoring points as calibration targets. So we had, I think, uh, 14 years worth of data for injection. So we used the first half for calibration of the model. We used the second half for validation of the model. And we need to continue to work in this in this manner to have a better understanding of what's happening in the subsurface fluids. Okay, so those, those are the main points. Um, I'm going to continue developing high resolution data that's consistent with the mission of our geological survey. Proved observation, I like to use the word artificial intelligence, but maybe we're not quite there yet, just advanced data analysis. Now that we have all of the data in the right format, in the same format, we can start to process and synthesize it better. And I plan to continue doing modeling exercises that are valid with uh, real world data. That's it. I want to just recognize some collaborators and partners in industry as well and have time for questions. one that's on my mind, and I know your fluid injection, but is there any correlation with the CO2 injection process? Have, have you collected any data on that? And I understand it's mostly K and OC. I haven't collected the data on that to the extent that I have disposal or water volumes. It does my curiosity is how much pressure is really, but if, if anybody's even yeah, that's, that's one of the next things on my list, to be honest, because I'm really interested in CO2. And then there was a talk yesterday about yes. the Burbank field. Mm -hmm. I want to learn more about that. Um, so I, I know which wells have disposed of water and CO2, so I could go back and collect that data, but I haven't done it yet. Um, but I, I, I do want to do that. I can tell you it's... I don't have data for Osage County for CO2, but I, I know that there's CO2 injection in other parts of the state, so I, I could, next year, I could tell you what more about that probably. Okay. It's a, just it's another another database that I have to build to exactly. try to get my hands around it. And I applaud you, it looks like it's such an undertaking to even get the position that you're at now. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's really great data. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in CO2 though. I, but I'll have that data eventually. Okay, thank you. Next year, that's my question. <laughs> Bob, you have a question? For <clears throat> practical applications, um, I, I, I appreciate and uh, in an awe of all the work that you're doing. Uh, do you? How do you, this is on how this information is utilized by the industry and then the regulatory bodies within the state of Oklahoma. My question would be, uh, do you interface <coughs> with, I, I know you interface with, no, that's my own question, do you interface with the seismicity department at OGS? Do you interface uh, often with OCC's oil and gas people to tell them what some of your preliminary uh, findings or possibilities look like. I, I just, from the standpoint of practical and political problems, how much of your information is being given to the industry regulators, which would be OCC, 
uh, oil and gas division. Are they aware of all your work and what you've got on the burner and some of the assumptions that you have seen? Yeah, that's, that's about 10 questions in one. <laughs> let me, let me, I've got another one or two. <laughs> let me kind of give you my back background and what my motivation is in a, in a sense. So, yes, I interface with OCC, not not as much today as I had at one point. There, there is a coordinating council which includes OCC, the UIC department, and now the New Seismicity department. And the OWRB has a representative, and OIPA has a representative, and OCOGA, and OGS, the universities are represented. So there's a, a group of people, the Secretary of Energy and Environment, Mike T, put that together, I guess, at uh, Governor Fallon's request. And it's being carried forward with the new Secretary of Energy and Environment, Ken Wang. I, I attended those meetings pretty regularly, because they were held monthly for a long time, and gave presentations, and updated what I was doing, kind of purposely remove myself from that so that I can get my research done, get it published, and then bring it to the group when I have something more meaningful. Um, so I have presented this correlation analysis to the Groundwater Protection Council meeting, which has a UIC conference each year. So regulators have seen kind of this correlation coefficient idea. And it was with a broad brush. I was just looking at the entire state. And if you do an entire state analysis, the Arbuckle saltwater disposal has the highest correlation coefficient. It's 0.7 plus. So it's, it's higher than anything I showed you today for the stack. That's too broad of a brush to really make any impact. I think we need to do what I've done with the stack. I need to move to different regions. So the South Cherokee platform, do the same thing. Central Cherokee platform, do the same thing. And what's going to come out of that is more meaningful relationships, correlation coefficients. And what I could do, this is, this is a different motivation. I have worked with some industry representatives and their legal team who are defendants in lawsuits for some of the major earthquakes. So, their wells have been identified as potential causes of the seismic event. So what can be done with this simple kind of analysis is you can do it on a well-by-well -well basis. What's the correlation coefficient for this well in that earthquake, or the earthquakes in this region? And I've done that. Uh, that's not public yet, necessarily. But I've done that for individual wells, and the correlation coefficient can go up to as high as 0 0.9, 0 0.8. So it's, it becomes pretty obvious, if from a statistical standpoint, which, which wells, which zones, which activities are related to seismic activity. Do you, do you want to take it that far? It kind of depends what your purpose is. But I think from a regulatory standpoint, if OCC if I publish this work and, and develop it more and do it as finer resolution, it probably could be useful to the OCC and to the industry to, to manage those activities. I don't know if I answered all your questions, but that's kind of the kind of sphere of what I'm working on is well, and my, why I'm doing it. Yeah, I appreciate it very much because so much of this correlation committees, etc. I've not been open to the public and have not issued uh, comprehensive reports of what they're covering. We have a new administration. I hope that uh, problem uh, goes away. And that's why I'm asking this question is that some of us wanted to attend some of those, but we were not allowed uh, to attend the various coordinating committees, et cetera. And hopefully uh, this new administration, this gets into the practical politics in uh, the practical applications of your research. So thank you for the ex explanations here. Yeah, and one of the reasons I kind of stepped away from the coordinating council is because it's a little more political than I want to be. I, I want to do research. <laughs> That's understandable. <laughs> and, uh, 
I don't want to get lost in the, the politics of it. Yeah. There's a question back here. Uh, I think you said that uh, you have little uh, data from uh, Osage County that, to work with. And my question is, is that because the Bureau of Indian Affairs will not release it, or you just haven't got around to it yet? Well, um, I guess that comment's probably, I should be more specific. I don't, I don't have access to the UIC data as readily as I do for the rest of Oklahoma. The, the oil and gas production data, I think that's pretty much available to the same extent as the rest of the state through IHS. I'm not sure how IHS gets OCH data, but it looks like they get it. A couple of years ago at this summit, I gave a talk on Osage oil and gas production and saltwater disposal because I had data that I was able to gather at that point. What I don't have is the UIC data, and that comes from EPA. So to the data that I do have for the UIC program from EPA, I obtained it by a Freedom of Information Act request submitted to the EPA. That was the only way to get it. And that was a one-time data dump in 2016 time frame. So I don't have anything past 2016. And I don't have any way to, to take the data that they gave us and compare it to the operator's report to say, OK, is this correct? Does it match their report? I do a lot of that with the OCC data. Here's the database that the OCC provides, and here's the report, and they don't always match. So I do a lot of that comparing and validating the data. I can't do that with the Osage UIC data. But otherwise, I think oil and gas production, maybe hydraulic fracturing injection data, that would be available because IHS is able to grab it somehow. Yeah, we have this uh, <coughs> problems mentioned, that mentioned on uh, we like to come into Osage, and we like to do things with the bill in Osage, but we can't get the cooperation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They will not release records to the release ordinary data that they used to release. So I appreciate your answer. Though. Yeah, there may be other pieces of data that you, they're not releasing that I don't necessarily right. digest into my databases. Right. I, I mainly look at how much comes out of the ground, where is it coming from. But I, I might not be as concerned about what the logs look like or um, the completion reports and those kinds of things aren't really something that I deal with. So if that's the kind of data that you're interested in or seismic lines or whatever it might be, Other question? Oh, 10 o'clock. Right. Time to go. Thank you.